Uh, thank you for joining us for today's discussion, um, the new dad experience and mental health. Uh, my name is Dwight Hollier. I serve on the Mental Health America's Board of Directors, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Um, uh, in addition to being on the uh, Mental Health America's Board of Directors, I'm also a licensed counselor and currently work at the University of North Carolina in the athletic department as a senior associate athletic director for health and well-being. Um, looking forward to this discussion. I will introduce our guest in a moment, but first I wanna go over some housekeeping items. Uh, this session is being recorded and will publicly be available in one week. The recording will be emailed out uh, to those of you who registered today's discussion, for today's discussion. And it will be available on MHA's site at mhanational.org uh, backslash webinars. We do not offer CEUs, but we'll, uh, if you would like a certificate of attendance, we have a form uh, that you can request one. And uh, that form will be included in, in the, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll post a link um, to that form in the chat periodically. And it will be included in the follow-up email as well. Finally, we should uh, have some time for uh, the audience to ask questions. So please post your questions in the chat box throughout. And now I'm so excited to introduce you to our three panelists for today, Juan, Kevin, and Hector. Juan Irby is the husband and father of two children. Uh, he is also a uh, birth and postpartum doula uh, with Kappa uh, Childbirth and Postpartum Professional Association, and Donna, the uh, Donna International uh, Doulas of North America um, for moms and dads. When he is not working his full time job, he is volunteering with the Postpartum Support uh, International, uh, PSI, or in the kitchen baking. How about that? Uh, Kevin Selden is the founder and Leading Impact, uh, founder of Leading Impact Consultancy, as well as the host and creator of Dads I'd Like to Friend, the DILF podcast. Um, how about that as a name? I love that. Uh, a top parenting podcast. The DILF podcast recently hit number six on Apple's US parenting podcast charts, uh, held as a rare form that speaks inclusively to both dads and moms while providing community for any parent seeking support and camaraderie. And Hector Manuel Ramirez is an Apache and Mexican two-spirit person. Uh, they is the first out person to be appointed to the Los Angeles County Mental Health Commission and is currently co-chair for the access for the USCC. Uh, Hector is also on the board of directors for Disability Rights California and the National Disability Rights Network, uh, where they provide oversight and accountability to the nation's only legally based advocacy organization established by Congress to protect the rights of individuals with disabilities in every state and U.S. territories. Um, thank you all for joining us today. So I wanna go ahead and get started and, and get us kicked off here. And, and this question is, is for everybody. And, and I think it's a, a really important question, um, uh, but it's also an opportunity for you to share a bit about yourself, um, but, but talk about yourself uh, a little bit more in addition to what's shared, uh, what was shared here in the bio uh, and your connection to mental health and parenthood. And so let's start, let's start with Hector. Uh, thank you, Dwight. Uh, first of all, I, I just wanna start uh, by thanking you and this organization and all the panelists for creating this space. Um, my name is Hector Ramirez, I'm Chico Apache. So I, I live in the ancestral lands of the Tatavian uh, Mission Band of Indians here, what is called Los Angeles. It's a very tiny little part of the United States. Um, and uh, as, as a person of color, uh, as, as a two-spirits person, as a person with a disability. Uh, my connection to mental health is, is lifelong. Uh, I grew up, I was formerly institutionalized and uh, recovering from that, I've been very, very active in, in disability rights uh, for all people with disabilities, particularly people impacted by um, what are referred to as 
psychiatric disabilities or mental illnesses or mental health conditions. Uh, I, I'm, I am autistic, uh, I am hard of hearing, so I have two hearing aids, and I also have a psychiatric disability diagnosis or what some people label as a severe mental illness. Uh, and that, that's just part of my identity. It's, 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 it's part of who I am as much as um, the color of my hair, which is black right now, you know? And in my, in, in, in my appearance, you know, that's, that's something that's very clear, but uh, my psychiatric disability is, is it's not a parent condition. And so that really impacts a lot of my identity, having to, oftentimes having to defend that which cannot be seen uh, or really advocating for those things that are not easily recognized. Um, and that's just perhaps one of the things that I do. And I'm two spirits. I'm Native American, so you know, for me, mental health is more than just wellness. It's survival. Um, it's radical care. It's you know, multi generational trauma. It's trying to survive, which is something that you know, it's it for many of us. It's an intersection that goes along with what we do. Great. How about you, Kevin? Um, thank you for having me and thank you for providing this space. Uh, my name is Kevin Silden. I, um, I have a, a, an interesting path in that I, I lived a, a, a not the most complicated life. Um, I, I had learning disabilities. I, I worked hard to, um, fight through them. I, you know, I'm a white guy from Los Angeles. And at the end of the day, I, I am a hopeless romantic and I've always wanted to be a dad. And uh, life in comparison to many was, uh, it was a very good life. I took a long time to find love. And when I did finally find her, I was excited to start a family. And uh, we could not get pregnant and I fell hard. And I think partly that was because I didn't have the backbone built up. Um, but more importantly, I had just wanted to be a dad my entire life. And one year hit and then two years and then three years and then four years. And people started to say, you should really just, maybe it's not in the cards for you. And we started to look into adoption and we started to look into other things, but there was nothing medically wrong with either of us. And uh, my wife really did not want to give up. And that is a deeper story of going into wh wh why we couldn't get pregnant. Um, Cause it was not medical, it was past trauma. Um, and, I, it was something that my wife was dealing with and, and I was trying to put, help her through it. And what happens a lot with men, uh, especially when it comes to family is we go into the background and no one asked me how I was doing throughout that five years. No one, not one person, not even my parents. Everyone wanted to know how Laura was doing with our struggles. And I am someone who, who is very expressive and has always kind of um, been outspoken. And I just found myself shrinking inside of myself slowly but surely. And I think that is something that transcends um, every sense of identity except for masculinity. I think that we as men do that. And especially we as dads, uh, slowly but surely it's like, is my partner okay? Is my child okay? So when we were struggling, I uh, was thriving in my career and I could not have been more miserable and no one knew it. And I, my job is to inspire passion in others. I, I run a social impact firm. I work with NBC Universal and Vanity Fair and The Roots. And I, um, and I have really guided my career since my 20s on being a very passionate individual. And I, I, had n I was devoid of any passion in myself. And I was looking for any kind of outlet to express all the energy that, that I had that I wanted to put toward a child. I mean, I was already building out a nursery idiotically when we were nowhere near getting pregnant. So when we finally got pregnant, it was, it should have been a blessing. It should have been a celebration, but I just went into panic mode. 
and I didn't talk to anyone. And I did the nursery and I, um, I, I did the registry and I planned my wife's baby shower. I mean, if I could have carried the baby, I would have. You know, I desperately wanted to be a part of this experience, but I never took the time to appreciate that I got what I wanted. And I and the thing about depression is it doesn't just go away. You don't get what you want and then all of a sudden you're happy. It just kind of goes inside and implodes even more. So the baby came out and I was a shell of the man that I used to be, even though I got what I always wanted. And we'll get a little more into um, the experience when I first became a dad. But for me, mental health was something that I had never truly struggled with um, intensely in the past. And for me, becoming a dad, I had to find the courage and strength to not only um, figure out what was wrong, but discover how to get through it. So I could be the type of dad that I wanted to be for my son. And that's one of the reasons I started this podcast, really to just find other dads that I would want to friend, you know, dad, I'd like to friend. And, you know, DILF podcast is a kitsch title, but the concept was just, am I alone in this? Because I ended up taking the first year off from work and walking away from the company that I built in order to attempt to be a stay-at-home dad for the first year of my son's life and become the man that I wanted to be again. And no one would invite me in. Women rejected me. Um, nannies didn't want anything to do with me. I, I was, it was so lonely as a dad. And I started the podcast to be like, is anyone else experiencing this? And it was surprising to learn that I was not the only one. You know, as many moms joined as dads, we got featured by People Magazine. It was one of those things where it's like, this was a missing segment. And more and more we're finding that uh, this is not a singular thing. This is not dad's problem. This is a global problem where men are experiencing it and women are part of it. And we all need to recognize it in order to have happier homes. So I look forward to talking more detail about it. Well, Kevin, thank you for, for sharing. Appreciate that. Um, Juan, how about you? Well, uh, again, to piggyback off Hector and Kevin, thank you guys so much for this opportunity and so much for this space. Um, like Dwight said, my name is Juan Irby and I am a birth and postpartum doula um, for moms and dads. So my connection to mental health is when my wife and I um, just had our uh, second child about three months ago. And based on my experience with our first, I knew I wanted to be more prepared. So I took it upon myself to become a postpartum doula because like Kevin had, had mentioned, um, men really don't have a safe space to talk about their feeling, to talk about how their birthing trauma was and so forth. So I took it upon myself um, because I suffered uh, postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety when we had our first child. And there, there were no support groups where I was living at the time. And there was really no one I could reach out to. So, um, a couple of years down the line, I took it upon myself to become a postpartum doula. And now I'm also um, a birth doula as well, because I want to make sure that men and women have a voice in a birthing room, making sure that they have the mental space to make sure that they can actually think and focus on their birth. And instead of the doctors coming in and nurses coming in, asking them so many questions. So um, all of that led me to pursue my knowledge, to pursue more knowledge and to develop my skills. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much guys for sharing. I, I, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to hear um, your, your stories and, and for you to be so open to share those stories with us. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about being the moderator on this panel and talking about childhood is, you know, my wife is an OBGYN. Uh, she's a professional baby catcher. Um, so I, I'd like to joke and say, um, she hates that joke though. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's, it's important. And, and as a parent um, and, you know, in my connection with, with mental health, um, 
you know, I, I was a, a young counselor when my when my uh, 18 year old was born and trying to uh, navigate that space. I went to every prep class. I read every uh, first dad's book. I, I had friends who had just had children as well. Um, and none of it prepared me for uh, the that experience as a parent. Um, so I, 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 I certainly understand where, where all of you are and, and how childhood or childbirth uh, impacts us in, in our lives as parents. Um, and when we look at uh, the impact of, of being a, a, a parent, um, uh, Hector, I'll, I'll ask you, can you talk about the other parts of your identity that, that impact you as a parent and not, you know, and I uh, understand that you're, you're an adoptive parent. So can you talk about your, your identities and how they impact you as a parent? This is Hector. Thank you, Dwight. Yes, um, it, it's different. I, I am not uh, what some people would consider a traditional parent. I'm two spirits in Shirikawa Apache, and um, because of the abuse that I experienced uh, when I was institutionalized, I'm not able to have children. Um, and so I, I like, like Kevin said, I always want to kiss. I always want to kiss. I became a teacher, uh, but it still wasn't the same thing. I have nieces and nephews. Um, and uh, that's really where part of my cultural identity uh, came to, to heal and to kind of uh, not only protect me, but also protect my community. Uh, I adopted uh, before the beginning of the pandemic, two children, two siblings, uh, two native children. And um, they are part of my community. And the way that this happened was done in a traditional way. Um, in the American culture here in the United States, um, there's a high potential of children oftentimes being removed from homes. Um, if the parent or the child has a disability or if there's other custodial problems. And so the possibility of having children removed is something that our community has experienced even to this day. Uh, if you're a person with a mental health condition, the system can deem you just for having a diagnosis unfit to have a, a child, whether or not you're providing. Um, and so to protect the children, my family as um, that as a two spirits, I adopted so that anything as well would happen to the, to the family. Uh, they're biological families. Um, not only are they part of our community, but they're protected. Um, and that 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 to me just seemed like a great idea. And it's not just a title. Uh, I I I have. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm so glad to be here, I forgot to mention, is that I get a break because I'm in the middle of potty training my toddlers, as I mentioned, perhaps. I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, and in the background, you might hear every once in a while some high-pitched noise. So I have an opportunity right now to really kind of share what that is like. Um, and I wasn't prepared for anything like this um, at all, uh, particularly you know, as a two-spirit person who doesn't really uh, embody traditional male, female kind of ideas. Um, we have uh, our own kind of cultural interpretation of it. And uh, those challenges and benefits are hard. Stepping outside and asserting my, my identity or my, my, the, the privilege of their children to have a two-spirit uh, you know, father, uh, parent, um, are, are cultural things that make it difficult. Uh, being a person with a disability, uh, mental health you know, that, that has you know, significant mental health challenges is also part of my identity. Um, you know, I, I, I have to consider sometimes that society might not see perhaps that I might be oftentimes, you know, the best placement for the children uh, because of my mental disability. And we know that that's just stigma that oftentimes has nothing to do with that. Um, I have two very loving kids, two very loving kids. They're thriving during this pandemic. Um, they've been stayed safe. Um, and I think they know uh, that they are part of a loving family uh, of a large community. Uh, and, you know, that, that's something that I'm able to provide, um, not only as, as in my space as, a, as an Apache person, but also as a disabled person. Because they see, um, they, they, they check my hearing aids all the time. You know, they, they think they're toys. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, they, they're aware that I have other things that people kind of notice as different. But it doesn't matter to them. I tell you, I've never had the biggest fans that I have in those kids. Um, and for me, that that's both a part of healing, uh, reclaiming my manhood, uh, you know, my my ability to to have been a father, uh, but also to be able to caretake 
particularly in these difficult times as a person of color. Um, you know, our masculinity is uh, oftentimes something that causes fear and horror outside for non bipoc folks. And we know the violence that we experience on a regular basis and the lack of justice because of the skin of our color. Um, and so surviving as a, as a male father um, and being a good father is, is kind of a scary thing. It's scary to be a father of a, of a child of color, um, realizing you know, the significant challenges that are built into our society, education that doesn't reflect us and tells inaccurate information, a justice system that you know, doesn't protect us, uh, a healthcare system that doesn't know us uh, and oftentimes abuses us more than anything. And so I think those are conversations that I'm having, I don't think I've had before I had his children and it, they keep me up at night and they're only three and it's weird, you know, but. I not only worry about making sure that I have enough diapers, um, you know, but I worry about what life um, is for them now and will be forward. Um, and I take, I take that responsibility um, with disrespect, with great respect uh, and seriousness. Um, and I know that's one of the things that we all have in common as, 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 as parents, you know, protecting your children, ensuring for their future. Um, and so I think that's one of the other ways that my identity is shifting and changing for the better. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, as far as impacts, one of the biggest impacts in, in being a new parent was uh, that that fear, you know, and, and that, uh, you know, you want, want to put your child in a bubble and protect them from everything. Um, you know, and, and a, a, a steel bubble, not not one of those plastic bubbles, but a steel bubble where, where nothing can penetrate and, and hurt them. Um, uh, and I think that that's something that everybody experiences. And uh, again, Hector, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, you, you, you know, sharing so much of yourself and, and um, it's, it's greatly appreciated. And, and I, I know that someone uh, listening to our, our, our conversation uh, will benefit from that. Um, you know, Kevin, you, you shared a, a lot about uh, your, your, the challenging aspects of, of your initial transition into parenthood. Um, and, and just wanted want to give you an opportunity to elaborate if, if there were anything else. I mean, you, you kind of went into some detail on, on those challenges, but uh, are there, were there additional challenges you had in, in that initial voyage into into parenthood um i think that in honesty i think this is something that um we're in an interesting time in our world right now i think that people are waking up to things they never realized were happening and particularly as a man uh but also as a white man I had a privilege that I did not realize I had. And I think that I consider myself to be extremely open-minded. I also just didn't realize a lot of the perks. And that particularly came to play as a man when I was a stay-at-home dad. I, I mean, when we were pregnant, every doctor ignored me. I, I cannot tell you the people I've interviewed where I just heard a story about a guy who went to the ear doctor and is a single dad. And the ear doctor was like, here's the problem. Have your wife call me and I'll, I'll discuss the medication with her. And he was like, well, why didn't you just tell me? And she's like, it's easier if I talk to her. And it's like, well, I'm a single dad. So there is no her, mm. you know, and this is, this is not uncommon. You know, I, I recently heard uh, a story on the podcast about a guy who was sitting with his kid at the park and he was an older dad who was talking with um, uh, an older lady and the kid was playing on the playground and um, they were, he was just talking about, you know, how much he loved being a dad. And at the end of this nice conversation, the woman turned to him and said, uh, I really hope you figure out a way to get a job so you can, you know, 
add some meaning to the to your life and and wow. get you know get your stuff together and it was like he just spent all this time bonding with her about how amazing it is being a dad we are just trivialized and ignored in a way that so many men in 2021 are fighting to get in and just like women are fighting to get equal rights in the workplace as they should have always had we are in an interesting way not allowing men those rights in the home and it's a controversial topic and i completely understand that it's a tricky topic but it's also important to know that for everyone to win, it's not about, well, I had one mom say, well, now you know what it's like. It's true. Now I know what it's like. But does that make anything better? Because in, most importantly, the, the, the goal here is for our kids to get happier, healthier homes. And that means everyone being able to be a part of the puzzle. And that means everyone needs to be a part of the solution. Absolutely. Absolutely. Juan, can you talk about some of the most challenging aspects of your initial transition into parenthood? Yeah. Um, so um, my, the most challenging thing for me for my initial transition to parenthood was not being able to do the things I used to do. Um, wanted to go out with the guys, wanted to have a drink here and there, wanted to, you know, just be in the moment with my friends, you know, and just have that, that guy time. But I had to realize that I had children at home. I had, I now have a, a another responsibility to make sure that they are taken care of to make sure that my wife is taken care of, to make sure that my wife is not gonna go through postpartum depression, anxiety, and make sure that she doesn't get overwhelmed with the children. So what, as time went on and the communication between my wife and I got better, uh, I would ask her, are you okay if I go out within this time frame here, and are you okay with the children by yourself? And if she says, yes, I'm fine with the children by myself, I can handle this. I would say again, okay, I just wanna make sure that, that we are okay, that both of us are on the same page and I can go out with the guys. And with that, she, she said, yes. And I also followed up with that with, um, if you do need help, I can call your mom who was right around the corner to help you come over and watch the children. Or I can have one of your girlfriends come over and help as well. And so with that, that's how we, the, that was the most challenging part. But once we figured out a way to get around it, it worked out and we can do it vice versa. So she can go hang out with the girls to get some, some self time to have a good time. And I can go out and hang out with the guys to give us that sense of normalcy again, even though we are in a new norm, this is now our overall norm of our, our, our culture saying, okay, are you okay? If you're not okay, please let me know and we can get the help that you need. And as a person of color, we have a tendency to think that getting help is going to make us feel bad getting help is going to, to feed us. That does not mean, oh, that does not mean defeat at all, like at all. That means like, it's okay for us to seek out help. It's gonna make you a better person. It's gonna make you a stronger person. And you can use what you learned in therapy or counseling to say, okay, I need to work on this so that way I can continue to move forward and do, and, and do the things that 
we want to do as a family and also as individuals. Uh, great, and and I appreciate you going there, and I and that, that transitions to to uh, another question I, I definitely wanted to ask all of you um, is is the impact of uh, being a new parent on your mental health and what you know what was that impact? And again, Kevin, you you hit that on the in the opening um, opening dialogue, um, but I I think for a lot of us and a lot of people, um, uh, being a new parent um, changes things for us. And, and like you won, I, you know, I, I had to get out of this um, sort of selfish mindset. And so when I, when I was thinking about these questions, one of the things I wrote down beside that question was selfish uh, because that, that, was, that was me from selfish, selfish to selfless and, and seeing that child helped me make that transition, um, you know, uh, but you, but even in that, you finding time to take care of your mental health um, is, is so important, uh, so important. Um, so, so Kevin, I'm going to kick it back to you again, you know, can you talk a little bit more about the impact on your mental health and, and uh, uh, you know, being a new parent, what that meant for your mental health? Okay, so I'm extremely opinionated on this. Um, and and I, I should preface this by saying that we have a big role reversal in our home. I, um, I'm, I am much more in touch with my emotions than my wife. And there was a sense in our home that my wife feared that she wouldn't have a connection with our baby. I never feared that. I think that my I invite her on sometimes to the podcast. We do a co-parenting series and literally like when we're in the middle of a fight, I, I, I convince her to turn on the mic and we literally hash it out from a co-parenting perspective to be able to show that co-parents fight and it's okay. And here's how we work through it. And here are the things we learn. And it's always extremely helpful for us. But oftentimes I find that the moms connect with what I'm saying and the dads connect with what she's saying. And so it's been very interesting for me hearing her perspective. And so to answer your question, when the baby came out, I thought, I'm going to nail this. I've always wanted to be a dad. I am going to freaking rock this. And the baby wanted nothing to do with me. And so I was already low from five years of trying to get pregnant. And then I was like a mess from not having any sense of worth during the pregnancy and wanting desperately to be a part of it, but not really feeling there was a space for me. And then the baby came out and the baby did not want me. The baby, you know, grew inside my wife. It knew her smell. It knew the sound. It, you know, I, I would take an hour to rock him and calm him. And my wife, it would be five minutes. The smell would do it. And it, I think for a lot of new dads, that happens and it alienates us immediately. It makes it slowly the pull away. And the biggest problem is a lot of men don't talk about it. So they think they're alone in this. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the number one most important thing in battling anything with mental health is acknowledging the problem and then communicating the problem. So once I realized that, I started the podcast because I was like, I've acknowledged it. I'm not only going to communicate it, I'm going to communicate it to the masses and see who bites. And I think that I have found, we have some very powerful people that have been on the podcast. We have some brilliant you know, dads, I've not found one person who didn't experience this in some form. I haven't found one person who doesn't, as a man, as a dad, feel second fiddle at times. I don't know if there are any Jews out there, but um, we, I joke in our home that, um, so uh, many of you probably celebrate Christmas. So I celebrate Hanukkah. Um, Hanukkah is a new dad and Christmas is a mom. And imagine like raising a, a, a kid and trying to say, it's almost Hanukkah. And they're like, where's Santa? And you're like, no, 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 not Santa. And they're like, where's Rudolph? Can we sing about Rudolph? And you're like, no, no, that's not Hanukkah. No, no. But here's something exciting about Hanukkah. And they're like, are there reindeer? You know, like that is being a new dad. You know, it's just, you're trying so hard to get invested and they just want Christmas. They just want mom. The world wants mom. Everything is about mom. 
Every magazine talks about mom. Every parenting blog talks about mom. And mom has this intrinsic connection. So we recently did an episode about martyrdom. And it's a really touchy episode, but I can't believe how many moms have written back and said, yeah, I, I can be a martyr because I feel like I don't want to ask for help and I'm good at this. And I and a lot of times moms find themselves, and it's not just moms, I should say stay-at-home parents, which unfortunately happens to be more moms than dads. But they find themselves overburdened because they're not asking for help. And then they're irritated at the partner for not helping them. And the interesting thing that I have found for the non-dominant parent or the non-stay-at-home parent, and mind you, I was the stay-at-home parent. So I found myself doing this exact thing where my wife would come home from work. And during that year, I would say, you're doing it wrong. This is how we do it. And I know a lot of dads out there listening are going to be like, yep, I know that. And I did it. And it was because I felt as a stay-at-home parent, I had a lack of, I was had a problem with my sense of worth because I was used to bringing in money and I was used to this sense of power and the world only gave me um, respect based on monetary and based on the name drops about my job. And so without that, I'm sitting here with a kid that can't really give me anything back and I'm giving to society and I'm being a wonderful dad during that year. But I feel like, well, my wife didn't have yogurt thrown in her face today. My wife didn't, you know, she got to go to work and, and as a non stay home parent, she had to have conversations with adults. So when she got home, I needed to prove my worth. And I was like, well, I created a system and this is how we do it. But by doing that, I was also kicking her in, in the shins. I was, I was taking away all her power. So she didn't have the ability to create her own patterns and her own, uh, her own connection with our kid in her own way, which really builds confidence. And I can't tell you how many times that happens for new dads. A lot of times new dads, we have to work harder. And it sucks, but you know what? It sucked for a lot of people. You know, it sucked for women for many, many years. It sucked for, you know, people of color for God knows how long. So for new dads, sorry, it sucks for a little. You have to work triple time because you have to work to build a connection that's not innately there sometimes. We don't have boobs, we can't breastfeed, you know? So you have to like, I did the night feeds because he couldn't reject me at night. You know, he was asleep. But I got bonding and then my wife got to sleep. Like there's a lot of tricks that we talk about. And at the end of the day, the most important thing is knowing it may be a little harder, but when the kid gets older, I know how to rock him for an hour while he screams in my ear. And I built up that pattern and I know how to calm him down. And now he's three and my wife doesn't always know how to calm him because it was really easy for her. It was natural. It's not as easy as for a toddler. So like there's perks to working that hard, but it's different. And you have to acknowledge it's not the same experience for moms and dads. And it's important that dads talk to other dads and learn ways that they can empower themselves and that moms and the stay-at-home parents allow the non-dominant parent the ability and space to create their own way and their own connection. That was very long-winded, I'm sorry. Very yeah, and, 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 you know, the interesting thing is you touched on three or four questions right in that one response. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I, I am interested, um, you know, obviously mental health is a lens through which I look at a lot of things. And so um, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear from, from Hector how being a new parent um, impacted you and your your mental health um you know i it, it, it's a transformation i i think you uh dwight really mentioned you know that that whole selfish kind of dilemma and i think for me i had to i had to surrender to the most vulnerable being in my life i had to surrender my life you know and commit that i was going to do everything within my power to make sure that it was going to survive and thrive. And it was it's kind of a weird thing because it's like commitment um, that sometimes we have to do, you know, as, as adults. Uh, and it feels like we're leaving our youth behind. It feels like we're leaving our world behind. And even when we want it, uh, it doesn't completely feel, you know, when you're tired and the kid will stop crying and, you know, and you, nobody's gonna listen to your advice, you know, because that's not helping. Uh, and there's no point in getting into an argument because, you know, 
you know, you don't count it until you feel that sort of thing. You don't really count to that child, you know, and I think that's that's primarily the, the thing that I had to kind of learn and to really uh, decide that I had chosen this journey uh, and that I had to show up. And that means getting up in the morning, uh, you know, every day when I need to, no matter how tired I am, to get things ready. And there's no excuse because there's there's a small, very vulnerable life form that depends on you for everything. And I am so thankful, you know, for people who, for fathers who, who have been doing this and are able to talk about it as I'm brand new, you know, and I am fortunate in the fact that the way that these children are growing is, is within my family. We have taken COVID uh, as an opportunity to really get our families together. Um, you know, we, we lost a lot of folks to COVID. We had a lot of folks that get sick. These children were a blessing, um, you know, uh, among so much death uh, this, this past couple of months. And so my mother, my sisters, we all, they all help. You know, and that's what they're doing while I do this, you know, and I think that has also given me an opportunity to really reach out to my male family members, uh, you know, for my native, my disabled parents out there, you know, keeping up with them on Twitter um, and, you know, really finding ways to make sure that I am going to be as healthy as I possibly can, especially during this pandemic, to make sure that they survive. I think I'm like committed to survival of the children right now. And that's the thing that gets me up in the morning, which is weird, um, you know, because uh, that's that has been a transformation. Um, and being able to talk to some parents, um, you know, especially just to, to have somebody listen, you know, I nag about it, and I nag now, uh, you know, and I hate that expression because I've been told not to use it. Um, and, uh, you know, and so I think really allowing me the opportunity to, be perhaps the father that I wish I would have had. Uh, you know, it's just I'm learning so many. I'm learning so much stuff from these kids. How to better communicate, how to listen, make sure that people listen, how to explain things, how to allow them to be able to explain things when they don't have the words. Uh, compassion in myself. Uh, you know, not to be so angry because you know they're not doing it right right now or because they're having a tantrum, you know, and just not taking things personal, you know, it will blow up at me. I am learning among this chaos, perhaps to be calm, uh, not for me, but for for somebody else by showing up. And that, that I think for me, you know, uh, it is something that, that really has transformed me to be able to hopefully survive uh, for them and my community. And it's kind of weird, but it's, it's just, be, it's become, I don't know, it, it, it's like I'm on a mission to make sure that they're okay. And I just never imagined that my brain could prioritize something besides myself or something like that. Um, and, you know, I, I'm just thankful for the, for the, for the, the breaks, the self-care, uh, knowing that there's no book about it. And even though I do go, I, I have like this parenting group, you know, that I, that I join every like Friday and we kind of like hang out and, you know, people talk about their horror stories and then it's like, oh, how are things going? Well, this one's biting now. Oh, they can do that. Oh, this one's spitting. It's like, oh, you know, and that's, that's kind of like a lot of this stuff because I don't know it. And even when people tell me, I don't believe them. But when I hear from them from my peers, when I hear from my peers, then I believe it. Which is, isn't that weird? Uh, everybody tells me how to do it. But until I hear my peers, like the other man, the other disabled people, you know, they're parenting, the other natives, and they tell me, ah, you know, it's like, don't worry, it'll work out. And that's just like, oh, it's that that lifting of like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And I was terrified at the beginning. I thought I was gonna fail. I thought, I thought, you know, I thought these children were gonna like the moment I brought them home, I thought I was so afraid. I was so afraid to be touch them, to hold them. And now I'm just afraid of them jumping at me and hurting me. You know, so it's 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 a beautiful thing. Um, but it's scary. Uh, but I think learning that I'm not doing this alone. Men and women have been doing it since time infinita. We're here somehow, they managed to get it right for, and I'm, you know, I'm thriving, you know, we are thriving, right? And uh, you know, they got it right, and we know they didn't always get it right. I know I can build on that. And so I just, I don't know the people before me, and you know, 
I try to be as humble as I can uh, and realize that I'm not in control here. They are. Uh, and you know, that, that's, that's, that's part of the lesson that I'm here to learn. Awesome. Awesome. And, and it sounds like you've, you've um, gotten yourself a, uh, together a little bit of a support system that, that helps you navigate this space. And, and, uh, and, that's, and that's great. And I think it's important for our audience to, to hear um, about those support systems that are in place. Um, so Juan, can you talk a little bit about the support system uh, that you have for, for your family um, that, that helps, your, helps your family, but also you as an individual? Yeah, sure. So what I did as a dad, um, and after I had, or after my wife had our children, um, and I knew that other dads were out there who wanted to tell their stories, but didn't know how to tell their stories or where to share their experiences and things like that. So what I did, I created a, a, um, a group chat for dads to just talk about any and everything. Like you said, Hector, about, oh, this one is biting now. Like there was a dad the other day, hey, my kid's biting, what do I do about it? You know, I may not have that experience, but some other dad may have that experience and they can share what, they, what they've done. And so that is my support system right there and having other dads um, talk about their experiences in the chat. And I can relate to some of them and some of them I cannot relate to. And for my wife, she also has a wife group that she has joined, um, which she can bounce ideas off of other moms, um, mom who have like who has like more than one child, um, who may be dealing with cloth diapers or not cloth diapers. Um, so for the the support having the outside support helps us internally with our family because we can bring some of those ideas that we got from our friends and say hey let's try this and see if it works if it doesn't work no file has been played you know we can definitely try something else and go from there so that the support system is very, very, very well. And also our family is very supportive as well. Um, when my wife had our, our second child, I was the doula for her birth, of course. And the one thing that my family did or our family did is they came up to where we are now for a whole month. And they took care of our son while we, were while we were taking care of our daughter. And they fed him, they clothed him, they bathed him. They did the daily activities that we would normally do with him. So that way that kept him in his normal habitat. And that helped us out a lot because we weren't worried about how are we going to handle him and the child. But once we got better, um, once we got rooted and grounded, we actually um, started taking care of our son while they were there. So that way we can also get a sense of normalcy and support. And now that we have um, done that, we can say that having a support system, having someone to talk to, having someone to be there for you in that moment is very, very important. If you don't have a support system, I encourage you to get a support system. I will be your support system. I will be there in your corner. Call, text me at any time you want to. You know, I have a almost a three month old, you know, and they're up in the middle of the night. So as am I, you know, <laughs> and, and as a dad, I support my wife at night. You know, she is breastfeeding our child. 
I would get up and change the diapers. I would have that bonding time with her. And so um, that's, that, that's just very, very important, like having that bonding time. And um, there was a quote from a, a psychologist. Um, his name was Paul, Paul Automo. Um, he is a relationship specialist um, and he studies parents and children at Pennsylvania State University. And he said, when fathers are actively involved with their children, children do better. And I truly, truly believe that. Mm -hmm. um, children will do better if their dad and if both parents are actively involved in their lives. So, awesome, awesome. That's great. Uh, and, and Kevin, you, you started the podcast um, as, a, as a coping mechanism for, for you. Um, are, is there anything else that you do um, that, that also helps to provide support for you and, and, and your, your family? Okay, so I just wrote an article for um, Parents Magazine. And one of the reasons that I've been working on writing a lot of articles is because we don't hear the dad voice enough. And the thing that I've discovered over the past few years is something that may sound intimidating, but in my opinion, we have a different kind of pandemic going on in our world and it's a lack of joy. And the amount of parents that I encounter who are like, I love my child. And I go, but are you happy? Yes, I love my child. Okay, do you feel joy? I do not encounter many that answer yes. And interestingly enough, I don't think there's anything that impacts mental health more than living a sustained period of time without feeling joy. And the way that I personally jumped in to fight that and that I encourage every parent, especially new parents to do it as well, is the opposite of what most would recommend. It's not going on autopilot. It's not self-preservation. It's actually engaging more. And as a new dad, instead of going, I am not worthy, I, no one wants my opinion, I'm gonna go and take care of myself and see my friends. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be taking some time for yourself, but we remove ourselves from the situation because we feel that we're not wanted. And that just pushes us further away, not only from our loved ones, but deeper in our heads and deeper into a depression, which only debilitates us more and implodes within ourselves. So I think the, the thing we need to do societally is to train people that when they're feeling rejected, engage more, fight for it. Because at the end of the day, the more that you create your own systems and the more that you create, you know, your own feeding schedule and you, and you take time and say, wife, leave for the day. I got this. Because many times, if the stay-at-home parent is home, the baby will choose the stay-at-home parent. It's who they're more comfortable with. And many times that's the mom. So dads are like, I can't win when you're here. So I say, I'm not mad at you, my wife. I love you, my wife, please leave. And that go enjoy yourself because I need time where the kid has no choice but me. And that's scary. But at the same time, that's how I got out of my depression. That's how I started to feel joy, was putting more weight on my shoulders. And that responsibility actually made me thrive. It made me feel, uh, it gave me a sense of worth. It gave me a connection with my kid. It made me laugh again. And, and I think sometimes adding more weight when it comes to a loved one actually can solve everything. And it sometimes sounds counterintuitive, but I think it's one of the keys to mental health is not disengaging. And obviously there's a lot of different things that go with that. And it's not just a blind comment. There's a lot more to discuss with it, but that's where I think um, mental health and new fathers um, intersect and it's about engaging more. Sure. Uh, and, and I appreciate that answer. Um, you know, I, I saw a, a question in the chat and I don't know if, 
if either of you have experience with this, I, I don't. Um, but how should a parent cope with losing a child and what should they do to, in order to create a loving space for another child? So um, if it's okay, Hector, Juan, um, I, ha I have a comment on that. So well, I mentioned earlier, it's not really my space to, to express, but because the question was specifically asked, um, my wife lost a child before us meeting. That was the trauma. And that was why we couldn't get pregnant, but we didn't know it. Uh, nothing was medically wrong with either of us. Just it, her brain was so powerful and it was because her brain was not ready to get pregnant, but her heart was, and she, she was the one who said, let's start a family. And I have not lost a child. So this is an interesting answer because what's weird for me was I was supporting someone and putting all my efforts in helping someone who had gone through that devastating loss, mm. but it was not my child. I had not lost a child. And so it was a very confusing thing, but I will say having not gone through it, but having helped someone through it, the biggest thing that you need to do is acknowledge it, is not push past it. Um, my mother lost a child before me. And she just thought the answer was having a new baby. And it's been over 30 years. And I don't truly believe that my mother is fully over it because you don't just band-aid it by saying, I'll get pregnant again. You have to face it. And I think that's pretty much uniform with any issue you deal with mental health. You have to acknowledge the problem. And obviously losing a child is devastating, but you need to take that time to mourn. And you need to take that time to talk about your feelings. My wife did post-traumatic stress therapy. I just did a lot of research and I found that something that soldiers do when they come out of war was, was something that was immensely helpful for her. Uh, there was, we tried a billion different things. She had trouble spreading the ashes. That was something that she needed to take the time to do. It took her years to be able to be ready to do that. But you, everyone will have their own way through it but you have to face it. And I'm not saying it's easy, but until you do face it, you bury it and it becomes more powerful. And just getting pregnant again, doesn't help you to face it. Thank it's you. It's just one perspective. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and, and sorry sorry for the, for the loss for your wife. Um, I, I, I don't know if, if you guys can give a quick answer, but I'm gonna ask a question and then I'm gonna ask you to answer it uh, very uh, succinctly uh, and, and, and brief. We're, we're two minutes before the end of this session. Um, what do you hope to see uh, in the future for parents, fathers, families, um, or, or paternal mental health? Um, I'll go first. For me, I want to see a more active role of dads in the birthing room. Um, I want to see dad. You only get one. You only get one. We we got. <laughs> I I'm sorry to cut you off. We got we we're, we're 259. I'm trying to get through. You. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Go ahead, Hector. Um. So I, I think definitely more representation of the viewpoints from our fathers, particularly from queer, disabled, black, indigenous people of color. Um, I think oftentimes our experiences are really drowned out um, from other experiences um, and the experiences and knowledge shares from our community, from our, our brothers and sisters, um, doesn't get shared, uh, it gets lost. And we oftentimes have to, perhaps that's part of the confusion, we don't have those paternal examples uh, from our community. Um, and we're constantly having to reinvent or to rediscover, reclaim our roles as as men of color, as parents, fathers of colors. Um, and I think that has been done intentionally, uh, you know, by removing parents 
uh, particularly men, men of color from these dialogues. Um, and so I really would, we really would like uh, not only for the recognition, but for some intentional space uh, for our community to, for our fathers, you know, to share, to learn, to keep that wisdom. Okay, thank you, Hector. And and really, really, really quick. Really quick, really quick. Uh, I think um, what I would like to see is, the, it's going to be a difficult thing because the problems that are occurring for most dads are not just on the dad's shoulders. It's a societal thing. And it's also affects, you know, it's how doctors and how people talk to parents and moms. But I think that the best thing I would like to see is for dads to fight harder and, uh, and to not disengage and to say, you know what, that doctor rejected me. I'm not going anywhere. And you know what? Um, I'm not the, feeling dominant in the home and my kid never wants me, still not going anywhere. You know, you're screaming mommy all night that my kid did it last night, not going anywhere. I'm here. I love you. I'm here to stay. I'm not leaving. And, and I want dads to state their claim and say, I am a part of this family. I'm entitled to feelings. I'm entitled to um, being a part of every aspect of this. And I am here to stay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Thank you so much. We, we've reached the end of our hour. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Hector, um, for, for your valuable conversation today. This was great. Uh, I know that we've touched everyone. Um, uh, we've touched a lot of people. And we'll be in touch with everyone within the week with the recording of this link uh, and uh, anybody who requests a certificate of attendance. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us. Happy holidays and enjoy the rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Thank you all so much.